Thank you both for making time to talk with us today. Um, Shana Pomerantz and Dan Rayfield, you're both running for the Democratic nomination for Attorney General. Um, how about if, Dan, if you wouldn't mind going first and just kind of explaining why you're running and, and why you believe you're the best candidate? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we all know that Oregon is facing a really unique set of circumstances and challenges right now from our housing and homelessness challenges all the way to our addiction and substance abuse problems. I think at the same time, Oregon also has a set of unprecedented opportunities to help or better help struggling Oregonians and to make sure that everyone is able to have the same opportunities in life. I want to run for Oregon Attorney General because uh, I believe that with the right leadership, the Department of Justice can be an indispensable partner in helping to fix and solve some of these issues and make Oregon one of the best places to work, live, and raise a family. In the private sector, um, I've spent 18 years, nearly 18 years of my life, um, practicing law, doing a lot of civil um, rights litigation, general civil litigation, consumer protection, essentially work on behalf of individuals against insurance companies and large corporations. Um, I also bring um, experience as a legislator and as the Speaker of the Oregon House, um, where I work extremely tediously to build a reputation based and built off of trust, strong relationships, and collaboration, um, while at the same time managing in a branch of government with numerous agencies and a budget of more than $400 million and um, about 400 plus FTE. During my tenure as speaker, um, we passed some of the largest housing reforms and investments the state has ever seen. We passed one of the most significant economic development packages in recent history here in Oregon. We established the first ever climate budget the state has seen, and that is now a norm. Um, and we actually passed the strongest reproductive health care and abortion protections in the company and somehow managed the time to pass um, some ethics and good government reforms in that time as well. As Oregon's next attorney general, I want to build on those things, um, and I want to expand the work we do on behalf of Oregonians and consumers. I want to protect our environment and our values from national attacks, and I want to work collaboratively with law enforcement as well as criminal justice reform advocates to keep our community safe. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Shana, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running? Yes. Hi. My name is Shana Maxi Pomerantz, and I'm running to be Oregon's next attorney general. As a community advocate, educator, and lawyer, I bring a wealth of experience and dedication to public service to this race. Throughout my career, I have had the privilege of working alongside elected officials in three state legislatures, including the Oregon legislature. My commitment to public service began at a young age, serving on various community boards and commissions, shaping me into a dedicated public servant. Most notably, I had the honor of serving as the vice chair on both the Portland Police Bureau's Equity Advisory Council and the Citizens Review Commission, where I actively worked to improve community relations and promote equity within law enforcement. These experiences have provided me with a deep understanding of the importance of community engagement and collaboration. As a first-time political candidate and a proud working class individual, I've had the opportunity to live and work in diverse environments, including rural, suburban, urban, and inner city settings, building a strong network within these communities. This extensive life experience has equipped me with a unique perspective on community building and creative problem solving. With over 30 years of experience in mediation and conflict resolution, I bring a collaborative and pragmatic approach to addressing challenges. I believe in the power of dialogue and compromise to find uh, sustainable solutions, drawing upon my legal and educational backgrounds to navigate complex issues effectively. My goal is to leverage both diverse background and extensive experience to serve as a unifying force, bringing people together to tackle our community's most pressing issues and innovative and inclusive solutions. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll just kind of bounce back and forth um, in terms of who goes first on, on questions. So Shannon, let me start off with you. Can you tell me what your top priorities would be if elected to AG? What, what would voters see four years from now if you were elected? Sure, so just listing them off, I, I want to definitely safeguard equal rights uh, and justice for all. Um, coming in as someone who has worked in uh, civil rights specifically the last few years, I've been 
the executive director of Race Talks, and a lot of my work has pivoted around educating the public on important issues um, and having a 360 approach of looking at it from a government standpoint, a legal standpoint, a policy standpoint, and also the community standpoint. We always discuss these things through the element of race, but the reality is socioeconomics impacts everyone. And so when I look at equal rights and justice, I think about all Oregonians in terms of how we can safeguard them here in our state. Um, the role of the AG often is characterized as the top enforcer but I believe it's actually the balancing of the role of enforcer, advisor, and advocate. And so with my JD, um, I do not come with an extensive legal practice background, but I certainly come with an extensive background as a community leader, uh, public servant through education and uh, doing community-based service. Almost all of my uh, professional service has been in service to community. And so while I might not be defending uh, in the courtroom, I certainly understand the issues and the impact to the families and the community who are impacted by uh, the legalities of our legal system. So I think coming in with that awareness is extremely important. Yes, you have to enforce laws, but we also have to be an advisor to the agencies and the people that we work with. And we also need to be an advocate in terms of serving all Oregonians and recognizing that a one size approach does not work for everyone here. We have to be uh, localized, which brings me to my third priority, which is how do we work collaboratively with law enforcement and community advocates around issues of crime, gun safety, and drugs? I live in Portland. So the issues that we deal with in Portland, uh, we know very well are not being experienced statewide. They're very unique. And so each community has its own unique experience that they're dealing with. They have local uh, challenges. And so taking a localized approach in terms of creating a seat at my table as the attorney general to be uh, responsive, but also to have an uh, open listening approach as opposed to saying, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to enforce it aggressively. So those are my priorities. Thank you very much. Um, Dan, how about you? What what would you focus on as AG if elected? Yeah, and I think it's, um, I always want to recognize when I came into the role of Speaker of the House, I had a ton of ideas because um, you're sitting on the outside. You always got to recognize once you get there, you know, half of those ideas, you know, might go out the door, you know, and so I so I say some of this stuff with a big caveat because there's a lot of learning to do when anybody steps into a new role and kind of assessing the landscape, but there's about five priorities that I would start off with or buckets of priorities where I would like to focus on. One is expanding the work of the Civil Enforcement Division. Um, during my time, you know, what we want to do is focus on value sets that we want to enforce in our communities, and that would be in the Civil Enforcement Division. One of those would be the creation of a working families unit. This is done by other attorney generals um, across the state. And this is really a focus on misclassification of workers, child labor violations, partnering with the Bureau of Labor and Industries on wage theft violations. Those are things that we can work and focus on, which help vulnerable Oregonians in that moment. Um, one of the other things that I want to do is create a civil rights unit, again, in partnership with the Bureau of Labor Industries to start moving forward. It's no um, secret that both DOJ and Boley um, are short on resources. And using that legislative experience to build and partner better in those areas, I think we can actually make a positive improvement in people's lives on the ground. I want to expand our work on the environment and climate protection within uh, the DOJ. Right now, they have, again, limited resources. This is something that Attorney General Kroger put in place a long time ago, and it's kind of dwindled a little bit. Um, they need some more investigators. They need some more attorneys to be able to really make a bigger impact because there's a, what I would say is a um, an imbalance in the way that agencies um, are charged for the attorney services. So there's not always an incentive to pursue some of those violations. Um, the other thing is I want to increase our securities litigation work. Um, right now, there are, um, and obviously the treasurer um, is responsible for maintaining a lot of funds. Um, there are times where we may lose a million dollars, $10 million because of securities litigation issues, but because we have to manage outside special attorney generals, we do not have the resources to be able to do that. And so we basically discard some of these lower losses as kind of a loss. I think that is not the appropriate path to take. I want to move forward and continue to move forward in that path. Um, I think there's opportunities to build safer communities. 
Um, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Shana when she says we need to partner better with law enforcement as well as community advocates to build those stronger relationships. One of those areas that everyone agrees on is drug dealing um, and the delivery in our communities. Uh, obviously, we strengthen that law. Um, in the past, other attorney generals have used some of their resources to be able to go against some of the larger groups, help with wiretaps and provide that specialized experience that say more remote communities just don't have, um, or you tailor it to what you need in a local county and those resources. I think it's really important because you partner and again, you tackle those issues together as a team. Um, there's also really important ways to improve the way we police um, here in this state and using the soapbox of the attorney general to partner with law enforcement to do that. If you look at what's going on in Gresham right now, um, they are using data when it comes to their motor vehicle stops. And it's fascinating. It used to be one in 22, they would find a stolen vehicle. Now they're about one in four because they're looking at different metrics. This is a pilot program that other states are looking at. There's no reason we can't modernize our policing strategies from a national level with leadership that then you're policing less in communities that have been over-policed, right? But you're getting better outcomes and people are safer in the process. Um, and so there's some symmetry that we can find in those places. I really want to use this role to be able to start exploring those things and be on the cutting edge like we have been in so many different other areas. Um, the other thing is, you know, I want to continue to protect our values from national threats. It is no surprise, and we have seen national threats to reproductive health. Um, more presently, what you've really seen, I think, is looking at some of our environmental laws, where they're trying to roll back EPA protections. Right now, there's about 17 attorney generals, Republican ones, challenging some of the ways that some of the states are being able to set different emission standards. Um, I think it's really important that the attorney general is focused and you have to have a balance. You've got to take care of in the state, but you also need to look at broader, um, you know, across the nation, to be honest, even beyond the walls of our nation. Um, within that, um, I also want to improve systems and outcomes at DOJ that also impact other agencies. Now, this is the stuff that's a little bit wonky. I think at the beginning, I mentioned housing and homelessness. You say, what the heck does DOJ have to do with housing and homelessness? Well, it actually has to do with a lot. You will see complaints um, from a lot of different folks that money is not coming out the doors within our agencies. What's going on right now is you have finger pointing between the DOJ and other agencies about, you know, the contracts aren't being done, we can't get these things figured out. We need to sit down as adults put in, and figure out where the roadblocks are and get away from the finger pointing so we can actually get money into communities faster. That's an incredible important priority that needs to, to happen. The state is also, um, we defend all of our agencies. There is a lot of room for improvement in the way that we go about that. I would like to partner more with DAS risk assessment um, and Department of Administrative Services so that we can look at how claims are being evaluated um, and ultimately how do we save the state money. We've all seen certain lawsuits um, in the news where trials have gone to verdict with really high verdicts. I want to be able to go back and review that and say how was the risk assessed um, as the attorney for the agency? Did the agency override the advice of DOJ and have better collaboration with the executive branch so that we can be making better decisions? I also believe in the private side, um, dispute resolution, and that's something I have a certificate and I've done that my entire career uh, in mediation dispute resolution. Um, the, what we have is early resolution programs, pilot programs have actually been very effective, especially in the medical malpractice range where you acknowledge the harm that has been caused with an apology, and then you sit down and discuss how you get through early resolution. Obviously not every case is ripe for an early resolution process, but I think that's something the state should be exploring as we look to lower the risk and save taxpayer dollars um, in the future. Great. I think we have a lot of priorities. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. All right. I, I was the only other two broader categories, I won't get into all the details, was how do you organize and lead on solutions to critical topics? So that are obviously like community correction, specialty treatment courts um, as well. So I'll shut up there. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Um, so that is a lot of priorities. And I guess, you know, just to follow up on that a little bit, I mean, would you be looking to significantly add resources to, to the AG's office or is this sort of a, a re, um, kind of, uh, distribution or a, a, a restructuring of, of what you're focused on right now? Yeah, I think there's, 
two different ways that I would do it. Um, one is you have your consumer protection and education fund, which is a significant way that you fund certain uh, positions within the civil enforcement division. And that's when we get these large settlements. This chunk of money goes into the protection and education fund, and then the legislature allots certain FTE. What I would like to do is we've seen the opioid settlements, you've seen the Monsanto settlements. I'd like to work closely with the legislature um, when we get these larger settlements to help fund and grow the practice in some of these areas where it's not a drag on the general fund, but we're using our settlements creatively to pursue the values here in Oregon. I do think that there are some areas where general fund is going to be needed where you're not gonna be able to do that. So for instance, when we think about uh, the criminal justice division, those areas are not necessarily areas where we want to expand our work and how do we improve policing and partnering better. Those are things that are going to probably have to be funded via general fund. But I do see um, right now that um, the statutes in Oregon, many of them, um, we're just not necessarily pursuing because we don't have the resources. Okay, great. Um, so let me ask you, um, and uh, Dan, why don't you start on this and then uh, Shana, I'd, I'd like you to answer afterwards. But um, you mentioned about, you know, the role that the DOJ plays uh, providing legal advice uh, to, to state agencies. Um, and this is interesting because I think Shana has personal experience that she might be able to, to, uh, to bring in as well. Um, but what, how do you see the AG's role in terms of um, both providing that legal advice while ensuring that it's actually following the law, that it's not acting um, with discriminatory intent, that it's not um, hiding records or failing to live up to transparency requirements. Um, those are pretty contradictory missions. And I, I'm curious, I'd like to hear about, you know, how you would approach that. Yeah, I think this is the real interesting part of the Department of Justice, um, because you are the attorney for an agency. Um, just like in the private world, when you're an attorney for an individual, the individual gets to make the decisions on how they want to proceed. You can give advice to an agency that says this would this is what our recommended approach is, or this is um, or we would go this different way, and this is how we would mitigate risk, say if it was in a defense context, in a litigation context. Um, they may choose to ignore that advice. That's where I kind of briefly mentioned I, the way that I think you start to do that is where you start to have better partnerships with the executive branch, because the executive branch is the one that has the purview over the state agency. So when an agency is making a really bad decision, you need to have regular contact within the executive branch to make sure that you are collectively thinking as a whole and mitigating those risks. I also believe one of the things I didn't mention is we think about mitigation of risk. What is done in the private industry, especially in insurance companies, is we aggregate claims data. Part of the reason we aggregate claims data is to look for the exposure and risk within each agency and using D DOJ or whether it's DAS risk assessment, wherever their appropriate placement is for this, is to then be able to go through and provide risk data back to the agencies above and beyond. So that way in the future, we're not making the same mistakes over and over again. That would be another critical element in that um, direction as well. Then there's also times where you're just providing advisory opinions to various agencies in those space. There is an area where agencies do not necessarily have the resources or they get worried about hiring the Department of Justice because of the cost, the hourly cost and their budgets to be able to move forward to do that. And so there is a disincentive often for many agencies to seek advice. I think that we need to take a look at that. Um, and that is the rate and hour model that the DOJ is currently funded under. There's other ways to look at that. There's the DAS assessment model, which could get rid of that conflict of interest where we're continuing to provide better advice at all times. But then again, when people aren't following the advice, having that accountability mechanism through the executive branch, I think is going to be the most efficient way when we're looking at, you know, the Constitution and the way that the agency structures are organized. And at the same time, you have to maintain confidentiality. There's, you know, we have ethical responsibilities as attorneys in that situation. Thank you. Um, Shana, so same question for you. The AG has, uh, in many ways, conflicting um, obligations, both to be the, the attorney for the state, for state agencies, as well as um, uphold the law and, and answer to the public. I'm wondering um, just how you would address that or, or what are some of the concerns you would bring in? Right. You you brought up my personal experience. So people who aren't familiar, I worked as a civil rights investigator for the Bureau of Labor and Industry um, during 2020. And some people are probably aware that there were two women uh, who sued the agency. I was one of those women. The other was my director, Carol Johnson. 
And what prompted the lawsuit for me um, really was the fact that I'm working for the agency that is supposed to investigate claims of discrimination and unfairness in the workplace, in housing, in public accommodations. And so the fact that, um, in effect, I became a whistleblower within the organization because I brought it to leadership's attention. Uh, the commissioner at the time, my boss at the time, who escalated it up, and nothing was done. It was not investigated. And so I look at the AG's office, and Dan referenced the Civil Rights um, Office, which is currently not its own division. It sits within the AG's office. It has less than Five people. It's under the leadership of Faye Stess Waters, who is an amazing person. Uh, there is the hate crimes hotline, but what if there was also a way to allow people who work within our agencies who are in fact employees and doing the work of the state um, to, to escalate up? So Dan and I both share extensive backgrounds in conflict me mediation and resolution. And so when we talk about the conflict of giving advice, we also have to look at what is the expense. So if the only time the AG's office is really being called in statutorily is when they need to offer the legal opinion, then that means that we're going to constantly be in a reactive place as opposed to proactive and preventative. And so if there's an opportunity to work out what are those conflicts that could create uh, a mediation arm of the AG's office to investigate ourselves. Because while we are the law firm of the state, we are defending and representing the people who fund us, who put us in these positions to do this work. And so it is a dual-sided role. And so that's why I said we need to balance out the enforcer, the advocate, and the advisory aspects of this work. Because I think ultimately, in my personal uh, uh, instance, uh, my director, her her claim went to uh, trial and she won a $1.7 million verdict um, and a million dollars in attorney's fees. And my settlement was almost half a million dollars. That's almost $3 million in taxpayer money that went out the door. But part of my settlement was still asking for a sit down meeting with the commissioner to talk about how can we deal with these issues. And because I sit on the Oregon chapter of the National Bar Association, which is the Black Lawyers Affinity Bar, and I have uh, a relationship with the Black attorneys, I did reach out to, um, I call her Judge Faye still, uh, Faye Stetz Waters, um, and said, hey, you know, I'm having this sit down meeting. Have you ever met with the Boldy Commissioner? Would you like to attend this meeting and open the doorway to conversation and bridging the arm? Now, in terms of the complexities of oversight of Boldy versus the AG's office, I mean, I think that's definitely a conversation. Um, I am as Dan mentioned earlier, I think it's important to, and my mantra is uh, under promise and over deliver. And so I like to keep the work simple um, because the reality is within systems of bureaucracy, we can come in with so many amazing ideas from the outside, but we see time and time again when our community advocates step foot into the government, it's a, it, you're a cog in the wheel. And so even if you say, I want to create change this big, it really looks more like this. But we have to think further down the road. So not just four years down, but what is the next three, four, five generations of this work going to look like? So I can say currently today, um, these are the things that are plaguing us. And we can be advised historically to what are the things that have plagued us in the past. So the hope is, how do we make small incremental changes from within to adjust this? So I would certainly say, how can we act as an advisor proactively to these state agencies? Um, and again, if we're dealing with it from a localized approach, that means not everybody's going to have the same needs. For instance, I talked to the public, uh, somebody who works in the public defender's office. And so when we talk about the rec recriminalization um, of, of uh, what is it, HB 4002, um, the challenge is once you kind of get into the pipeline, do we have enough public defenders? Is that something that the AG's office could offer some support around, especially around problem solving? So I certainly would want to look at that and see how can we step into this. So that's just one example. But I think ultimately, I 
can certainly see there's a need to expand around the civil rights, offer support directly to Boley, but I would say even within other agencies, this is plaguing where we have a lot of um, internal issues that end up escalating up to litigation. And my sense is it could be avoided um, if we were able to be given the authority to have a more proactive stance on this. Now, part of also dealing with out outside entities that are coming in and doing business with us is we also have to model good practices. So if we're not walking our, our talk, then other people will think they can come in here and do the same. And so I think it's really important that we be very clear about how we are showing up in our own in our own house. We have to take care of our own house. Um, and so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Um, actually, uh, your answer just kind of leads naturally into another one of our questions, and that's about um, HB 4002, the recriminalization of uh, uh, possession of small, small amounts of drugs. Um, and Shana, if you wouldn't mind going first on this, and you did touch on it in terms of like, um, you know, considering what are the possible uh, ways that the AG may be involved in either, um, and I'm not even sure, but just, you know, it's, it's up to counties to decide how to, whether and how to provide opportunities for people to uh, seek treatment as opposed to remain in the criminal justice system. Do you have any thoughts in terms of what the AG should be doing? Great question. I, I definitely feel like the role of the AG, first and foremost, um, the element of enforcing laws and upholding our laws, that is the primary responsibility. Um, I also believe that we have to look at um, what's just good policy and good practices for our communities. And um, I was a little disheartened, you know, that that the bill passed in the way that it did. Um, I live in Portland. I see a lot of the impact of houselessness and joblessness. And um, so when I think about drugs, uh, when I think about crime, um, as somebody who has worked in community uh, through nonprofits, as an educator servicing families who are impacted by drugs and crime, um, I know it's not just a, a kind of... Um, singular issue. Uh, it's There's a lot more issues on the table. And so the complexity of it is, I think I'm, I'm mostly deeply concerned about how we put even more weightedness on the criminalization of people who are already so far marginalized in our communities. So I say this with the caveat that I understand that this has passed and that there are processes and procedures. I also say it with the understanding that statewide, everybody is dealing with their issues um, differently. And so taking a localized approach, looking at how we can act more in advisory capacity, a support capacity. Um, just the other day, a friend of mine who runs an organization here in Portland, uh, Restorative Roots, I was able to hear testimonials of our alternatives to incarceration um, from both the offender and the victim where there was healing that occurred. And that's powerful. You know, when you think about why are people using drugs, why are they engaging in the behaviors that they're engaging in? It's generally not, I'm just into this and I want to break laws. There's something uh, deeper at the core. And so I think as an AG, how can we look more deeply at the core? How can we better um, assist people across agencies? You know, I know as a teacher, um, at one point, 75% of my students had a parent who was incarcerated and it was due to small possession of drugs. And so the impact is not limited just to the person who is penalized. The, the penalty actually ripples out. And so I think coming in with an understanding of how our work ripples out generationally, we have to have an awareness of that. And so there's a lot of people out here who are doing great work. I want to definitely engage them and bring them to the table. Otherwise, it's just business as usual. Thank you very much. Um, Dan, same question for you. I guess what role should the AG play? 
Yeah, and I, I, just to acknowledge, I mean, this is a very difficult conversation for us, like all, like all of you, like we've all um, had a personal experience, um, you know, with someone in our lives with substance abuse. I was like, I've seen physical abuse and substance abuse up close as a kid. Um, and I have, and I've, I've mentioned this uh, multiple times, I often wonder what would have happened if my mother and I were under the system of the 1980s, a very different system um, than we have today. And so that has weighed heavily on me in the way that I think about this role, the way we approach 4002 um, and, the, and the nuances to that. Um, as you move forward, I mean, most of the enforcement, I think, Helen, as you noted, is going to be done locally through local DAs um, and through local law enforcement on the front end, that first point of contact um, is incredibly important in the way that it is actually implemented um, because the way it implement, gets implemented can have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And we have to be monitoring and focusing that. And I believe the attorney general should be at the table to help monitor and look at those reports um, and be able to be an advocate to make sure that we have the best practices across the state as we implement deflection programs with the hope that all 36 counties will A, want to engage in these programs, and then B, have the resources to be able to do so. In the upcoming 2025 legislative session, normally um, agency heads are so focused on their own budgets, they do not look at outside priorities. Uh, I think that we kind of, and, and the fear is that I'm not going to get the resources for my agency because I'm focused on these other critically important um, elements over here. And so they kind of um, cocoon up a little bit, if you will. Uh, and what I think the Attorney General's office needs to be front and center with our behavioral health advocates in the communities, um, with our law enforcement, and with the district attorneys to be able to help advocate and be a spokesperson for what is the right level of funding that we need in our communities to do this right. Um, because I agree with Shana wholeheartedly, the deflection on the front end um, is critically important. Um, and that's what we hope everybody wants to move forward in. Um, and I think that and making sure that those are the best practices moving forward are going to be extremely important. Um, I also think that it's really important to acknowledge that what we did in the short session is not the conclusion of a conversation. This is a conversation that is going to go on um, you know, for more than a year. It's going to go on for um, probably longer than any of us really want it to, given the nature of some of the, the drugs that are in our communities. I think the Attorney General's office is a perfect place to be uh, a, a convener, a collaborator at the table to help bridge those gaps of relationships between law enforcement and community advocates. Um, because the one thing that I absolutely know, I've sat through all of these meetings with absolutely everybody, everyone cares about the human being they're trying to help. Um, there is no doubt about that. It is the mechanism and how in which we are trying to do that. Um, and everybody has ideas. And I think the evolution of what works and what will work and what we believe today will be very different 10 years from now. And I think we need to have, be open-minded and continue to lead those conversations as we shift and change with the landscape in our communities. So I'm committed to doing that. It's incredibly important. I also think that you can partner on the back end. There's, there's other things that are tangential to House Bill 4002, especially treatment courts. We can do better there. Um, we started that process in the short session, but we can do better. Community corrections. This is another place where we fund directly to counties, but we're not looking at outcomes to provide the right supports, the right services at the right time, so we can actually reduce our recidivism. We don't want to talk about it, but Oregon has some of the highest recidivism um, long term. And we also need to be looking at how we're measuring outcomes. You know, the, the the old methods of looking at, you know, the the time periods of recidivism, we should reevaluate that and say, what are the best mechanisms to do that? I'm excited to work on those things and kind of use the soapbox of the attorney general because you don't have that direct ability to enforce, right, in, in the traditional sense. But I think it is important um, in the role as a statewide leader to be at those conversations and convening. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, and Dan, I think you go first on on this next question. Um, let's see, I guess it was last year we learned about, gosh, two years ago, sorry, um, the $500,000 donation from Nishad Singh to the Democratic Party of Oregon. Um, this was something that was initially kind of uh, looked at by the Secretary of State's office. Um, an element of it was was sent over to the AG's office. Um, and there's, I, I think, kind of from, from our point of view, real question about the level of independence that um, both the uh, the Secretary of State's office and the AG's office showed, considering that they are both um, just the, the the deep connections between the Democratic Party of Oregon um, and both of those offices. So I guess I'm wondering for you, um, do you feel like you 
um, have shown independence and could exert uh, independence on things in which um, your fellow, uh, you know, where for, uh, fellow uh, Democrats, uh, people you've worked with many years could be implicated? Um, absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing um, in a democracy is the foundation which it is built upon, um, the integrity of the systems that we have, whether it's our election systems, the Department of Justice, you name it, are critically important. When you start losing the integrity in any one of those institutions, that really starts to unravel at the framework of a democracy. And it's um, concerning that even you, while there may not be, because we, I do not know, I can't sit here and tell you today whether there was any impropriety, but the fact that there remains a perception of impropriety is a problem. Um, and so that A, number one, looks at the methods in which that that went forward for the Secretary of State, as well as the Department of Justice, and the type of transparency that happened on the back end. There could have been good reasons not to pursue a, a criminal case, but those should be discussed openly in a transparent manner. Now, obviously, you have to balance um, you know, when you're going through an investigation and the uh, what I would say is the confidentiality within that. But when you come out on the other end, I think it is critically important, not only for whether it's the chief elections officer or the Department of Justice, you must have integrity in those offices. And that should remain paramount. Um, and, and that doesn't matter whether you have a friend who is on the other end of that or whether it's a stranger on the other end of that. Those have to be held higher. There are some things that are bigger um, than us as individuals. Um, and to me, um, I think democracy, how we govern ourselves voluntarily is um, a wonder um, in this world, given how um, broken we are as human beings. Um, and somehow we make it work um, every, um, every, every year. So that's critically important um, to me as we move forward in that process that integrity is upheld um, and you follow the facts um, in those spaces. Are there are there ways in which you feel that you have shown that independence? Um, I think you can look at. I mean, if you look at, um, I, I don't think I've ever considered myself um, an insider per se. I think when you look at my background, I mean, I struggled. You know, I tangled uh, with the law enforcement. I struggled in school. Moving forward, um, when I came in, I pursued policies. To be honest with you, and the ethics and government reform space that were not popular with frankly, either party um, or the lobby. Um, and we continue to move forward with those, trying to move those to, to move in a, in a better space. Um, there have been policies, um, as I've sat as Speaker of the House or as Ways and Means, um, where we move through policies that um, at times did not have a majority of Democratic support because that was the will of the body um, and moving forward. And I believe in the process. Um, and I believe that those things should control uh, and it makes it um, it doesn't make it easy when you're in those roles as a human being to do those things. Um, but I believe um, the, the process and the institution are there for a reason and, and you follow those things. So, yes, I do believe that I've done that. Okay, thank you. Um, and Shana, um, for you, I guess, uh, just do you feel that you um, can show the kind of independence and, uh, uh, you know, take action, even if it implicates people you work closely with, um, agencies that you're responsible for, um, and are there examples where you can show that uh, where you, you have shown your independence in difficult situations? So, so just to speak back to the specific question that you asked about the $500,000 donation, I can't speak directly to those details, but I can certainly say that even the way that I entered this race as a candidate, um, I filed late. Um, in terms of contemplating stepping forward. One of the biggest reasons I stepped into the race was um, the way I was handled as an employee within the state and not wanting anyone to experience that. Um, as I tried to lead with conversation first, using employing my mediation, conversation, dialogue skills that I promote through the work with race talks that I do and everything else that I've done in my life, um, it didn't work out. And so what I would say is that I live in a community, even though Portland is very large, um, we we sometimes call each other community cousins. Uh, I come into this community generationally. My grandparents, I'm a third generation Black Portlander, Oregonian. Um, my grandparents owned a corner store and barber shop. And so when I moved back after law school, um, I'd say my name, Maxie, and that name recognition is, oh, I know your mama, I know your grandparents, I know your people. And so there's a, a, a responsibility that comes with that. Um, 
my mother was very upset that I didn't identify myself as a maxi when I went to go work as chief of staff to Diego Hernandez um, in the legislature uh, because she felt that, you know, it would let people know who I was. But I also knew I was there to do a job and to represent someone in their office in a neutral capacity um, and create relationships. And so Unfortunately, even in that role, there were some th things that I saw within that office. And as a mandated reporter, I reported it. Unfortunately, I was fired um, as a result of that. And I went on with my life. I continued to work. And five years later, there was a legislative inquiry and I was given uh, an apology as subject number five. Um, that was out of my control. You know, but when I see wrongdoing, uh, it's important to engage in dialogue first with the people, uh, have a conversation. Again, as an AG, when you see people um, breaking the law, especially if they we are working for them within our agencies, it's all always warrants a conversation as you, as the attorney. Hey, do you know that you are doing this? We need to correct this immediately. Now, if you've already done it, then we have to take action. And I think ultimately the bottom line is we have to come from a place of integrity and transparency. I am not stepping into this as a politician. I'm stepping in as somebody who has worked in community um, and have fostered relationships. Dan is coming in as house speaker. He's gotten into that place through fostering uh, relationships. I would like to mention that not all things are equal. Unfortunately, I've had certain experiences that have prompted me to have to advocate for myself in positions, advocate for other people in community, and it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, partially, that's what it means to move through life looking like me, being a woman of color, being a Black woman. It means sometimes I have to speak up and advocate for myself. Sometimes it means um, upsetting people. Uh, who want to say, I don't know my place. And the reality is that if we are voted into this work, if I'm voted into this work, then that is the job, that's the responsibility, and I take it very seriously. So if you do wrong, there's going to be consequences. And like I always say, you have to deal with the consequences for better or for worse. And so people have to make those decisions, and I'm prepared to stand behind that in terms of the work of the AG. All right, thank you. Um, I just have one last question and it's about public safety. And, and Shana, if you can go first on this, Oregonians list public safety as one of their top concerns. And I guess I was wondering, what does that, that concept mean um, in, your, in your view and what should, uh, how should the AG promote that? Or should the AG promote that? It's a great question. I mean, I think in terms of the traditional lens in which we look at public safety, it has a lot to do with guns, drugs, and crime. Um, I'm old enough, I'm 48, I'm old enough to you know, remember Rockefeller drug uh, laws that were created and seeing the impact of it when I was teaching in the Bronx, uh, teaching high school students there. Uh, I grew up in Oakland, and so I remember the three strikes you're out laws. Um, so when we talk about public safety, unfortunately, uh, as a Black woman in community and diverse communities, working class communities, um, I come from a divorced family. My mom was a single parent until she remarried. My father was a single parent until he remarried. We mostly lived in apartments. I still live in an apartment. Um, by the time I was 18, I probably moved over 20 times in my life. So when we talk about safety, it's not limited just to guns, drugs, and crime. It's about our education. It's about, I saw fights. I saw people almost murdered in school. You know, fights were so egregious. Um, we talk about guns coming to school. I saw this happening in my school regularly. There was a point in the 90s where I couldn't go anywhere as a kid without my body not looking at the door because I had to be concerned about how to exit. And so these are not new phenomena, but I think if what we're doing is applying um, antiquated approaches that criminalize brown and black folks and for poor white folks, then we are employing old ideas 
to an old problem. I'm suggesting let's bring a new solution to public safety. We do know that crime typically takes place when we have a lack of housing, lack of job, lack of uh, socioeconomic resources to support people um, that we know there is data that supports that. But instead, we continue to do the simple thing and say, let's continue to criminalize people that break laws instead of figure out how to support folks and give resources. Now, I'm not saying we don't have people that break real, you know, commit real crimes. We do. Um, but I would say most people are law abiding and they want to follow within the confines of the law. So when we talk about uh, drug use, fentanyl is terrifying in my mind. Um, what is happening, the access that the kids are getting, I can't imagine, uh, you know, when I was in high school smoking weed, I grew up in Berkeley, California. That was something you can do. We know we have it legalized here. Vaping is extremely harmful uh, to people and it's very accessible. Uh, we have to continue to educate people about the harms and the realities of these drugs. Um, if you don't understand what you're looking for, it's very easy to use it uh, Dan talks about his his youth uh, and, and getting caught up in the system a little bit. I, I say, by the grace of God, <laughs> the dumb decisions that I made as a kid uh, were not documented. And fortunately, we didn't have Instagram and Facebook <laughs> to, to have the uh, proof of these dumb decisions. But the reality is, as kids, we all make dumb decisions that there's just no getting around it. And so I would say, you know, we have to look at what is this pipeline to prison that we are creating. We do know it starts in the education system. So how are we looking at that? How are we creating safe school environments? Is that an element that the AG's office can support with? Possibly. I, I don't see why we couldn't get involved in some kind of way. We certainly know that kids um, have exposure to law enforcement. I know in my community, I did. So if there were opportunities for education and learning that could have come by seeing other alternative pathways, is that available? It's certainly something worth exploring. Um, I think ultimately, I'm gonna go back to saying there's a localized approach. One, one size fits all is not gonna be the remedy, but I do know if we continue to employ the old remedies, criminalization, if that's the only thing that we're looking at, then that is gonna continue to keep us in the place that we've always been. Great, thank you. And Dan, uh, same question for you about public safety and, and the AG's role. Yeah, I think it's important, and we've talked about it a lot today. There's uh, the AG's role is pretty multifaceted. There's the agency advice. You're um, you're the state defendant. You're the state prosecutor when it comes in the civil uh, side of the world. But you've got this broad um, component of responsibilities. There is a subset of the function and responsibilities that is public safety um, by definition and in statute. Um, and so, you know, by nature, you do have an important role. Um, I think that there are opportunities within that role. Like I talked a little bit about, we have the, the crimes against, uh, internet crimes against children, right? And the expansion of that work. There are certain areas where there are gaps in the work um, that the DAs are, you don't have necessarily the resources to be able to pursue. So we think about like public corruption. That's not always something a local DA may, you know, be able to be suited for, right? So when do you fill those gaps? Um, and again, fostering those relationships with local law enforcement. I think right now, one of those gaps is um, the delivery of uh, substances right now. Uh, and so that is somewhere I think a gap where it is a natural fit to partner. Now you don't take over the authority of a DA, you need to have a collaborative conversation to see what are the appropriate roles between the two to then lead that. And then I think you help convene and lead that conversation together to tackle a big issue that right now, that's what we're seeing 10 years from now, it may be something different. So I think there's a very important role there. Um, I think there's also the secondary role where we think about public safety and what is that. We can look at some of the, I mentioned a little bit about the contracting and the efficiencies where there's the finger pointing. I'm look, I really look forward to you know, examining and getting into that. That has a indirect impact uh, on public safety, right? And the delay of money getting into the community. So we can't ignore some of the indirect impacts. 
Then there is what I call is kind of the, um, the role of a leader in our state and in our community to lead on very important topics. As the Attorney General, uh, while you may only have a portion of your responsibilities being public safety, the, I do believe that there is a very important element to leading on those certain issues. When we think about gun violence um, in our community, suicide prevention, um, in those areas. Those are things that we've led in the legislature. I want to continue to do that and use the soapbox of the attorney generals to lead on those very important issues. I mentioned earlier community corrections. Um, it's very challenging in the legislature. Like we normally think about policy and being led in the legislature. There's bandwidth issues. Um, being able to be at the nexus as a statewide official between law enforcement, the legislature, and advocates you can convene people to make progress on these very important topics that right now um, are not getting what I believe is um, you know, the elevation that they need to get in the legislature. Um, and so those are the type of things, and, and again, especially treatment courts. I think that there is a world of opportunity um, still there. I think, again, the opportunity to be at the nexus of what we've started deflection. Is that where we're going to be 10 years from now? I think we need to be at that. So I think there is a very important role that you play. I think you also have to acknowledge um, that the way that we define and see um, the word public safety is different for all of us, right, depending on the experiences that we've had in life. Um, and I think that is very important um, to just acknowledge in that space. Um, but it is something that I think, if you know, I think hitting it head on and the responsibilities and moving forward again with that focus that we're all really want those same outcomes in the end. Um, Thank you very much. Um, would you each like to have a minute just to to sum up or just kind of why again voters should be should choose you? But um, if so, Shannon, would you feel comfortable going first? Sure. Uh, again, my name is Shana Maxi Pomerantz, and I am running to be your next Attorney General. As the prospective Oregon Attorney General, I am committed to pursuing several key objectives that will advance justice, equality, and community well-being across our state. So my primary goals include, firstly, I'm dedicated to bolstering assistance for victims of crime and individuals who have experienced injustice. It is essential to provide unwavering support to survivors, ensuring that their voices are heard, their rights are protected, and they receive the resources and care they rightfully deserve. Secondly, I am focused on enhancing, excuse me, enacting comprehensive reforms to address systemic inequality and discrimination within our society. By implementing meaningful changes at the systemic level, we can strive towards a more just and inclusive Oregon where every individual is treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. Lastly, I aim to foster collaboration between law enforcement agencies and community advocates to advance community-centered policing practices. By working hand in hand with stakeholders from law enforcement and local communities, we can cultivate policing strategies that pri prioritize mutual trust, transparency, and the well being of all community members. Through these initiatives, I aspire to serve as a proactive and responsive Attorney General who advocates for the rights of all Oregonians, champions justice, and builds bridges between diverse groups to create a safer, fairer, and more equitable state for everyone. On May 21st, I'm asking you to vote for Shana Maxi Pomerantz for Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dan, any parting words? I just want to say thank you for having me here today. I am um, genuinely excited uh, about the opportunity to serve as Oregon's next Attorney General. I genuinely believe the Department of Justice really truly adds an important nexus to some of the biggest issues that we're facing in our state. And I think with the right leadership, I do believe we can make some significant progress on some of the issues that we all care about. Uh, the five things that I, again, am really excited to work on, uh, we're expanding uh, to protect Oregonians and being the attorney general for all Oregonians um, when it comes to whether it's consumer protection or environmental values. I want to help build safer communities. And we talked a little bit about what that means in terms of the collaboration with law enforcement, uh, community advocates, improving our policing policies. There's some real low-hanging fruit that we can make a difference in our communities and have safer communities at the same time. I think it's also a critical role of the attorney general to protect the values of all Oregonians against any national threats. Nobody runs for attorney general to do that, um, but it is a part of the responsibility that we have on behalf of all Oregonians to do that. Um, I want to improve, and this is the wonky thing that um, you wouldn't put on a mailer, 
but I do believe that there's a lot of systems um, to improve at DOJ and with all agencies to make a more well-run state in terms of collaboration. We talked a little bit about that today, exploring those pilot programs of dispute resolution. And again, it may not work in all situations, but anytime we can respect the people that are involved in any dispute uh, when the state is a defendant, um, that's a good thing. We can treat people fairly in that space. And I also think that there's ways um, to look at the efficiencies with our contracting. So many other, um, I think, very creative things that we can do with a fresh set of eyes um, in those spaces. Uh, I think finally, the, the, or the Attorney General needs to lead on really important topics um, where they are at the nexus of those groups and where we are not getting the momentum that we need. Uh, talked a little bit about those when it comes to gun violence. I think there is, um, when it comes to suicide and some of the, what I would say are common sense solutions that we're seeing other states adopt that do make a meaningful difference. I want to be at the front of that. I want to be helped leading that conversation. I want to lead the conversation when it comes to improving our community correction systems. Again, recognizing that they are implemented locally, but that you can be a convener to help find solutions that ultimately help um, humans along the way um, as they are going through the system. These are things that I'm very excited about, um, and I would be um, honored uh, to have um, your vote. Well, thank you both. This was a really great conversation. Um, I covered a lot of different topic areas and I appreciate your coming, uh, making time to talk with us about this. Um, we will be in touch if we have any more additional questions, but um, I think we're pretty much all set. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see Thank you, you all. Thank you so much. Very nice.